information you received to be extremely accurate. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. Right away, I think everyone knew this was going to be a big story. I mean, you've got four college students taken down at once inside the same home, and the chief comes out pretty quickly and, and says, listen, no forced entry here. This was a targeted, isolated attack. So most of us thought it should be solved pretty quickly. But that's not what happened here. We need to make sure we clarify. Okay. Have them restart or restart the speed or... We arrived in Moscow just days after the murders, and you could immediately sense that this was a community on edge, and you could understand why. Four young people have been brutally murdered, and nobody knows why, and nobody knows who's responsible. I actually met a group of professors from the University of Idaho. They were out for a bike ride, and they really summed up what the community was going through. It has deeply affected all our students and our faculty and our staff, and it's been just a struggle to to get through this last week, so. How hungry is this university, this town, for answers? Very much so. Uh, there is makes, makes this even worse, you know. All of us shaken. I've heard from people all across the country talking about this tragedy. It's a small college town. We all know each other. People in the community knew these students, so everybody's affected one way or another. And part of it's because we just don't know anything yet. During the window of the murders, we don't know where this car was. We don't know where it was parked. We just know nothing about the car. Identification of the Hyundai Elantra as like the suspect vehicle, that's a problem. Another part of the case against Brian Koberger is an eyewitness account, Dylan Mortensen, one of the surviving roommates. She told police that she saw a man around the time of the murders dressed in black, bushy eyebrows, wearing a mask covering his nose and his mouth that walked past her down the hallway. And then we have Dylan, the surviving roommate, and she's so afraid that she goes in her back in her bedroom and locks herself up and then doesn't call 911 for eight hours later. Okay, that is highly unusual. We look to expected behavior, expected response, reasonable response. That is what makes sense to jurors. Jurors are normal people. So you tell them a story, it better make sense, right? Doesn't make sense. Credible witnesses. Enmity always matters with witnesses. And this witness comes across as credible. Is she flawed? Yes. Next, the house on King Road. No one of us are here now. And the type of person capable of committing these murders. Whoever did this, be it Koberger or someone else, is a sexual domination killer. Plus, Brian Koberger's defense. If he says, I was in this house before, that's why my DNA is in this house. All of a sudden, you might have a completely different trial. What did Dylan Mortison actually see that night? She opened her door three times. You can imagine every time she opened a door, the house made squeaky noises. That's what the previous tenants have said. How come DM wasn't scared to open her door thrice. That does not make sense. I don't believe that if it was allegedly Brian Koberger that saw DM or DM opened the door and saw him, I don't believe he just passed without seeing or noticing that somebody opened the door. That doesn't make sense at all. That shows DM wasn't afraid of whoever was in the house for her to open the door three times. And we've heard that the roommates were texting each other. So what exactly took place during the time of the unlivings? What did DM actually see? 
what did DM actually not see? Because in the beginning of this case, we were told that DM and BF were sleeping in the first floor. 49 days later, everything changed. The affidavit came out and it said that DM is all of a sudden a witness and she opened the door three times and saw a man with a black clothing and a mask the third time. Was DM made to be a witness? Maybe she wasn't even actually there. Or she knew what was going on. Because if they were texting each other, the Technic forensic team in the FBI can see where they exactly were, their location. Most likely they were at home and they were texting each other. So that means they deliberately did not report a crime. And that should be a federal prosecution. Let's not forget, the chief said from the beginning that I did not say they were witnesses, I said they were just there. Hi, Heather Roberts with ABC News. Just to follow up on what she asked, so the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? All the information that we have from our investigation is that, yes, they were. Okay, but they were unhurt. That is correct. So is there any explanation as to why it took so long then for someone to call 911? You have surviving witnesses to an incident at 3 or 4 in the morning, and the 911 call didn't come until noon? I don't think I ever said that they were witnesses. I said they were there. Um, so, you know, we don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. Um, would have we loved for that to have happened? Yes, but that, that's not how it took place. So um, we're, that's why we're investigating everything still to try to pull all the pieces together. Were they one of the people, were, were they the 911 caller? Um, at this point in time, um, I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is um, just because I want to keep the um, integrity of the investigation at this point, okay? I try my best not to get caught up with how DM feels, how she's allegedly supposed to be feeling, because that is speculations only. And as a licensed mental health counselor, I think we can never judge Surviving roommates, I guess, even if they're witness or not witness, because we don't know what they have seen and what they haven't seen. That is the problem. Although my personal opinion is that it is very strange that it took eight hours for someone to call law enforcement. Four people are unlived in a horrific manner. The coroner herself said that it was a horrific scene. It's strange that Brian Christopher Koberger had, besides a touch DNA on the leather knife sheet, he doesn't seem to have any blood DNA or any other serious DNA, as far as we know. Although the case is on gag order, if they had something to use against against Brian Christopher Koberger, they would have done it by now. They wouldn't have waited so long. That's what I believe. But I don't believe DM was a witness. You will heard the chief himself say that I did not say that the surviving roommates were witness. I said, I just said they were there. What does that mean? 
and they were sleeping the first flu. And now she's a witness and she's allegedly sleeping in the second flu. Which one is it? I heard many YouTube channels and many creators talking a lot about Dylan parting and her father saying that she was she going through survivor's guilt. And I try not to indulge with that at all because as a therapist and profession, I'm mindful enough to know that anything is possible. But when I speak about Dylan, I criticize the fact and say the fact that eight hours, nobody called 911. That is fishy, and that's a red flag. And now we hear they were texting each other, second red flag. I always believed, personally, for entertainment purpose only, that an inside job was done. Someone on the inside was working with the suspects. I always say suspects. I believe even if BK was involved or if he was innocent, I believe that there were more people in this horrific unlivings. It's a bit strange that her father was complaining about his daughter and her stepmother saying that she's going through a lot, which I assume, but now that she's parting so quickly, of course raises concerns, but not alarms. Because let's not forget, it's been over a year. These are young students. She could be totally innocent and she could have feared for her life I've always said this on the beginning. The only way I could believe that Dylan and Bethany were innocent in this is if they were threatened by the people who did these crimes. Of course, you would be scared if you're told. And this is the Greek life side. They must have been told your lives are going to be saved and spared in only one condition. Keep your mouth shut. So I take that into consideration. And of course, she's a human being. It's really heartbreaking and sad, but she's not going to cry 24 hours and think about it. She is going to go out and live her life. We keep on forgetting she's 20 or 21. So I don't think we should judge her too much for that, but we can judge her for, beha for her behavior not calling law enforcement, whether she was high, whether she was intoxicated. She and BF have no right not to call law enforcement for eight hours. Even if you are going to a shock, shock phase, like she said, she's in a frozen mode. I can understand that, but still it doesn't explain eight hours. That means they weren't scared that the Killer would come back again to the property. This doesn't explain. This doesn't make sense. And she should be mindful going out and partying. Yes, she should be. But on the other hand, she's still a young woman. And if she's innocent, it's been over a year, she's not going to stop her life. So we can't be too harsh on her in that state because that will lead her into a mental illness. And nobody is guilty until proven guilty. We don't know if BF is guilty or honestly. Many people don't believe that. Many people are just saying, show us more evidence. And, that, and it could be possible that BK was the one who did it. But there's many things under gag order. But I still believe that there were more than one person and it doesn't add up with the previous timeline. 
I believe the timeline we were giving in the beginning, 3 to 4 a.m. And livings happened around that time. That was when the Banfield Taylor Avenue stop was going on. That was when the figures were running. DM knows definitely more than she's saying. But the question is, what is the reason? Is she scared? Has she been told later on maybe to, to act like a witness since she's already in the mess? Her being a witness, is that fabricated, allegedly? Is she lying? Did law enforcement cut her deal? Allegedly? Just asking questions. Something doesn't seem to be right with DM and BF. And especially BF. Because BK asked to speak to BF. He said that she has information that could ex exonerate him. And that's important. So what do these two girls know? Did they call B BK to set him up? How come they had time to text each other? Where's the empathy? Where's the sympathy? Where's the emotions? Four of your roommates are brutally getting unlived. Why wouldn't you call 911? That proves that they knew the suspects. DM allegedly heard people running upstairs and she thought it was a party. So what was exactly going on there? I believe these two girls knew who the killers were and I believe they knew that it could have been boys from the fraternities and the Sigma Chai. Bethany Funk was at the party, the Sigma Chai party. Nobody saw Eaton and Zano from 9.45 to 1.45 p.m. They weren't caught in any social media pictures. Explain that. What happened at the Sigma Chai? I've heard many rumors and speculations that DM called Kaylee to come back. But we've heard Kaylee's mother honestly saying that Kaylee had her last lessons on Monday, so Kaylee would have had to come back. But I believe all this is pre-planned and somebody inside or some people inside are working, allegedly, with the suspects. They were always searching for a white Hyundai Elantra 2011 to 2013 model. And the timelines, the first 49 days, was 3 to 4 a.m. that the unlivings happened, and that made sense. Pay attention to how loud the sliding door is when it opens and when it closes. It doesn't make sense. I believe somebody was waiting for Kaylee and Maddie already inside the house, maybe hiding in the first floor. Hey there. Yeah, just pay attention to the door. Okay, would you mind going and getting somebody she's to place this Oh, she is? She's at the door. Yeah, she's at the front door. You want to send her up back here? I apologize. We knocked at the front door, no one came. Yep, thanks, ma'am. You can hear the sliding door opening and closing. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. 
loud. Is this your place? Yeah. Perfect. You know over here? Uh, I see noise. Noise, yeah. Yeah. Big speaker right there? Yeah. No. Neighbors start calling in, then we have an issue. Fair. Uh, he goes. Uh, downstairs to the back deck. Interesting. The sliding door is really loud. When they open it and when they close it. Oh, yeah. Where does Hunter Johnson fit into this role? He seemed to be there in every police body cam, twice at the house or thrice. He was called before 911. He was the one who called 911. I wonder if he was already inside the house because we didn't hear how quickly he came there. It sounded like he was there immediately i know that the sigma sky sigma chai is just a couple of minutes away like two three minutes from the girl's house but he was there faster than that it seemed like i wonder if he moved the bodies around how close was he to kaylee how close was he to mary and to zana and especially to eaton because Eaton was one of his best friends. Where was he that night? We didn't see him in the grub truck. The 911 call caller is still under the gag order, but in other cases, we always see the 911 caller being released. I do understand this is a high profile case, but it still doesn't make sense. Why did these surviving roommates take eight hours to call 911 and they call Hunter before 911? That is another red flag. There is one. Karen, what do you think? You can clearly hear it. Um, you can definitely clearly hear, hear it from that officer's body cam. My question is, this could be an obvious question, were there other students or young people in that field far away where it got picked up, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at this, um, where else could that, those screams have been? And that's a pretty big field. And the obvious question would be, were there other students out walking through there, playing around, messing around perhaps? And is that what we're hearing? Or is it coming from the house? I submit to you, somebody is saying, stop. Now, who that is, I have no idea, i.e. a person. It is a ticket book, 25, 16. And this is what I think I hear. Yeah, 19, 19, yeah, is 19, where was the yelling coming from? Stop it, stop. This was three minutes after Kaylee and Maddie called Jack D. I wonder if they were walking the dog outside or if they let the dog outside. Like Kaylee's sister Alivere said, but how would she know it is another question. Did something happen to Maddie and Kaylee when they came outside to get 
Murphy, and maybe they couldn't find him. My sisters did everything right. They went out in the buddy system. They went out together. They Ubered out. They stopped and got food. They Ubered home. They let their dog out to go potty, and then they locked their house up. Ubered home. They let their dog out to go potty, and then they locked their house up. They did everything right, and this still happened. How would Oliveria Congals know this? Did the police tell her that? Or did Dylan Mortison and Bethany Funk tell her that? How would she know that when they came home, they let the dog out to party? Did someone try to take Murphy so that they could come outside and it would be have been easier for the suspect to have access into the property and into the victim's territory. How would Alivira know this information? Who took Murphy? Why wasn't Murphy harmed? He wasn't injured. He didn't have any blood. He didn't have any DNA evidence on him. He wasn't touched a bit. I think everyone who comes into this house knows Murphy. It had to be somebody who knows Murphy really well. That Murphy, Murphy obeys. I want to find out whose car headlights were shining at 3 a.m. in the morning from King's Road. This was the car flash from 3 a.m. in the morning. You can see the car is in front of the girl's house. All these areas are important. Taylor Avenue, King's Road, the figures were running from there to the Sigma Chai and the Banfield stop, the undercover stop. Justice for the victims. Have a lovely week.